Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining St. James Episcopal Church in Mount Airy, Maryland for online worship today. You can follow along with our slideshow. All the parts that are in bold are meant for people to say at home, and you're invited to write prayers into the comments on Facebook um, at, the, at the time of the prayers, and I will read them aloud and lift them up. We're glad that you're worshiping with us today. And now let us begin our worship service. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord, amen. May God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, poured it, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. 
The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and it may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Psalm 106, we will respond at the asterisk. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Who can declare the mighty acts of the Lord? Or show forth all his praise. Happy are those who act with justice. And always do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have for your people. And visit me with your saving help. That I may see the prosperity of your elect and be glad with the gladness of your people. That I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned as our forebears did. We have done wrong and dealt wickedly. Israel made a bull calf at Horab. And worshipped a molten image. And so they exchanged their glory. For the image of an ox that feeds on grass. They forgot God their savior. Who had done great things in Egypt. Wonderful deeds in the land of Ham and fearful things at the Red Sea. So we, he would have destroyed them, but not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach. To turn away his wrath from consuming them. Our second reading is from a letter of Paul to the Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and Synthache to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is any worthy of praise, think about these things. 
Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Once more, Jesus spoke to the religious authorities in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves, and it have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. There, go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. morning. Gracious God, take our minds and think through them. Take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. If there was an award for best hyperbole, then Jesus just might win it for this parable. Everything seems over the top. From the response of those invited to the royal wedding, to the invasion of the army, down to that final drama with the guest without a robe who's thrown into the outer darkness. One commentary described it aptly in this way. Jesus is painting with a broad madcap brush, as if creating a grand caricature or a daring work of graffiti. Jesus as a rogue graffiti artist is an image that fits considering what he's been up to. Remember that just yesterday in the continuity of the story, he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna before going straight to the temple and throwing a ruckus with the overturning of the money changers tables and driving out those who were buying and selling. On this, his second day in the temple, 
He further riled up the establishment, going back and forth with the chief priests and scribes and eventually the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Today's parable is the last over-the-top story he told before their final combative conversations and his denunciation of them. So perhaps it isn't surprising as Jesus is making his final stand, as it were, and proclaiming his message to the very powers that be, that the heart of this parable is about the grace that God extends to us and the expectation of transformation as a response to that grace, the very renewal he's been calling for throughout his ministry. Because for all of its violence and threats, today's parable extends good news and hope to those who will listen. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. It begins simply enough, provoking an image of extravagance and love, but also perhaps exclusion. After all, how many of us would be expected to be invited to a royal wedding feast? And yet we are told that those who were invited not only refused to attend, but turned to violence, mistreating and killing those who came bearing the invitation. The king responded in kind, decimating their city before then expanding the invitation and welcoming all. This parable reads less like a morality tale and more like a highly stylized allegory. It is here that I must in good conscience warn against an anti-Semitic reading of this passage. It is too easy to read it as God extending the covenant to the Jews who rejected God's son Jesus. And so it was that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed after which Jesus's message was extended to the Gentiles who accepted it and then replaced the Jews as God's chosen. Reading this parable in such a way has throughout the centuries been a justification for prejudice and violence, and it has no place in our theology. I once heard New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine, who is herself Jewish, speak. And during the talk, she told a story of taking her young son with her to class at at Vanderbilt Divinity School and standing him at the front of the lecture hall beside her. She told her students to never say anything from the pulpit that would lead someone to want to hurt him just because he's a Jew. This passage can and has done just that. And while those allegorical connections may be made, it's not the only way to understand what this gospel is up to. Here's a more nuanced unfolding of the parable. The king is God and Jesus is the king's son. The invited guests represent insiders who fail to listen to God and let let themselves be distracted by worldly idols. The messengers likely represent the historical Hebrew prophets, many of whom were ignored, mistreated, or killed, most recently John the Baptist. The destroyed city refers to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, which actually happens after Jesus' death, but is a part of the lived memory of those who were hearing this scripture. The open invitation evokes the opening up of the Christian community to include the Gentiles as well as Jews. And the servants that bring them in could be missionaries who bring everyone, good and bad, to the church. Reading the parable in this way solves the problem of using it as a weapon against Judaism, but it doesn't make sense of that final violent interaction between the king and the guest without a robe. What are we to make of that? When the king sent out his servants the second time to gather guests, he gave them instructions to invite everyone they found in the main streets. We then read that the king noticed as he wandered through the banquet that there was one guest who was not wearing a wedding robe. After being questioned as to why and giving no reason for this sartorial faux pas, he was bound and thrown into the outer darkness. Why we ask if the king invited everyone from the town, presumably presumably including those who are poor and who could not Um, did not have the means for a special robe, 
then why did he get so angry? Why this violence? The missing piece of information here, one that those who originally heard this parable would have known, is that it was the custom of the time, especially for the wealthy and certainly for royalty, for the father of the groom to provide wedding robes to all the guests when they arrived. What does it mean then that the man was given the robe and chose not to put it on? It's nothing short of a rejection. That changes the story, doesn't it? It points us toward an understanding of personal responsibility, perhaps even obligation. And it adds a depth to that final line, for many are called but few are chosen, that would otherwise not be there. God's grace and love are extended to us all. That is, we are all invited to join the feast. And yet we are not allowed to be passive in receiving these gifts. We must put on the robe and accept our place at the table. Accepting them means that we also accept that our lives must change because of them. This is the heart of this final parable Jesus told the religious authorities as he was staring down the looming shadow of the cross ahead of him. This is a parable that God is still telling us today. Beware becoming like those who are invited but refused the call because they have made idols out of the ways of the world. Beware becoming like the one who answered the call but couldn't accept the invitate that the invitation included a change of heart and life. For many are called but few are chosen. Becoming a Christian and living faithfully comes with a price. We can't earn our salvation, but neither are we free to live as if nothing has changed. Following in the footsteps of Jesus necessitates that metaphorical change of garments, which is in reality a transformation of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. It is to live lives that embody the great commandment to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In these days of division and fear and uncertainty, when every decision we make, when every action we make seems loaded, from the conversations we have, to the things we post and share on social media, to even the way we vote, well, let this question be your guide. What is the most loving thing I can do? And then do it. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy and Catholic, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. 
for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are, oh goodness, can't read it. Alone. Thank you. <laughs> for this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Eugene and Robert, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God's church. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, you are invited to name silently or aloud your prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. Prayers for Nancy and her family, for Dave, Sandy, Denise, and Bill. Prayers for Ashley. For Creed. For Debbie. For the for Nelson the, family. For the Nelson family, yes. From our comments, I um, offer these prayers for Linda K, Linda A, Diane, Sandy, Mike, Ron, Rachel and David, Bryant and Wynn, for Denise, Jason and Amy, Mary and Sandy. For Rob. For these and all the prayers of our hearts, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing our, your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your, uh, all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever, amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace, everyone. Peace, peace. with you. Peace. Peace, peace, everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace, be with you. peace everyone. Peace to all. Peace.
Um, now we have uh, just a couple of announcements today. First, uh, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today, and uh, we're glad that you found your way to our online worship. If you would like to know more about our community, please visit our website, check out our Facebook page, or drop me an email, and I would love to connect and talk with you. Let's see. Our Thanksgiving food drive will be um, starting this coming week on October 15th. It will be, I believe, in the, yep, in the Shell newsletter. And um, this year we are hoping to be able to provide meals for 10 families through Mount Airy Net. We usually do five. We're doubling that this year at the behest of our outreach committee because the need is so much greater in our community. So please keep your eyes open for that. We do the next slide. And later this month on Tuesday, October 27th, we will be having our fall Red Cross blood drive. You can contact Bryant Delaney in order to sign up to donate blood or to help out by working the blood drive that day. In particular, we are hoping to uh, be able to sign up folks to work the blood drive who um, are not in risk groups. The, the Red Cross does an amazing job of doing um, lots and lots of uh, precautions uh, in um, these days of COVID. Uh, but we are hoping to be able to recruit folks who are in low risk categories. So please contact Bryant if you are able to help that day. All Saints Sunday is coming up on November 1st. Uh, at both services, we will include a reading of uh, the names of the faithful departed. So if you would like to submit names, please um, email those to the office or in the Shell newsletter or on the website, you can click the form to fill out. And just a little teaser that our stewardship campaign for this year, which is uh, faith-filled generosity is the theme, will be launching in two Sundays. So more information will be coming about that shortly. I think that's it. Are there any Thanksgivings of the community today, birthdays, anniversaries, or other moments of grace in your life that we can celebrate with you? If you're on Zoom, you can unmute yourself. And I'm just going to take a real quick look at our Facebook feed to see if anybody's popped a comment in. It's got a reload. Uh, Nope. Okay. And I think we can go ahead and move forward, Richard, to our virtual offering plate. And just a reminder that as you are able to please um, mail in or drop off your pledge or gift to the parish, and you can also um, give through the diocesan giving portal online. All information about this and details can be found on the uh, homepage of our website. Now for the blessing. Life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. His kingdom, peace, His glory of flesh. Jesus Christ, first and last, the backwards of Him. His kingdom, peace, His glory of flesh. Jesus Christ, first and last, the backwards of Him. He built His throne up in the air, the backwards of Him.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Have a great week, everyone. Be well, and we'll see you next Sunday. Bye.